Welcome back to the Rehab for Runners podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lisa, and today's special guest is a PT who specializes in treating the hip. Welcome, Dr. Sarah. Hi, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, of course. So I was on your podcast and now you're on mine. So this is going to be really fun. Yes, it's fun to do like back to back weeks. It's like I feel like I just we just like finished talking to each other. I know just catching up about our weeks. It's been so (laughs) fun. Um, So I know that you're known as the hip doc on social media. Can you tell us how you got into treating hips? Totally. So it's a bit maybe trifold, double fold, we'll say. Um, I was doing an orthopedic residency and fellowship at a just outpatient physical therapy practice. And I felt like I just kept seeing this same like person come in, like a woman runner or an active woman with hip pain. And I felt like this ideal client was just like so underserved. Um, so in that time, I just really asked my mentors for a lot of like specific guidance for these patients. Um, and then just so happened to be that I started to develop my own hip pain. Um, that kind of took me out of running for a while. So I feel like the the combo of that really like inspired this passion for me to literally talk about the hip all day and running all day. Yeah, I like that. I know for me, like same thing. I got into this really because I was injured rehab myself and I wanted to help like someone who has been going through that as well. Cause I know, you know, when you're a runner and you're injured, it's like, it's not just about, you know, Oh, you can't run like to a non runner. That sounds simple, but for runners, it's a lot more than not being able to run. So I love that being able to help like your previous self. What was your hip injury? Like what, where was the pain located and all that? Yeah. So I'm a super nerd and so is my husband. He's also a physical therapist and we went through the same residency and fellowship training. So I've never had it imaged or have actually gone to the I guess it would be the physiatrist that I was planning to go to, but my symptoms were and still sometimes are mostly like anterior hip pain, like really deep in the groin. Sometimes it'll kind of radiate down like the front of my leg into like my knee area esque. Um, I don't really have any back pain, but I'm like super weak on my like right low back and then into um, my adductors and like outer hip. So all of that comes together to say, I would say I probably have a liberal tear and maybe some sort of dysplasia on the right. Um, but again, can't, can't clarify that without specific imaging. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, if you're able to manage the symptoms, you don't need to get imaging. I think that's something that a lot of runners think like, you know, maybe for peace of mind, but when you get peace of mind, you also get this fear of, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, my, you know, I have a torn labrum or, oh my gosh, like I have inflammation. Like the way that certain doctors can come across talking about what they see on imaging can really provoke a lot of fear. Do you see that a lot? Oh my gosh. Yeah, for sure. And honest to goodness, like even for myself, I told my husband, he was like, Sarah, just go get an image. Like just go. And I was like, I cannot believe you're telling me this. (laughs) Um, I knew that if I knew that I had something for the rest of my life, I would just blame it on X that they found in the imaging or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the like kind of guide rail that I set up for myself is I reached out to one of the physicians that I work with and refer to that's phenomenal. And I said, Hey, this is what I'm going through. If it gets to the point where it's, um, you know, severe enough or not getting, not getting better, like, can I come in and like go through the process of getting imaging? And he was like, yes. And then my PT and him kind of worked together to make sure that I didn't need to get to that point. So like, I felt great not going in for imaging and now I don't know what I have and I love not knowing what I have. Yeah, exactly. Cause again, like when you're treating yourself or your husband's treating yourself or PT, they're going off what you're experiencing. Like what are your impairments? And like you said, like if you see like, oh my gosh, I have a torn labrum, like grade two, whatever, like I'm just going to blame the pain on that and think I'm never going to get better. I think a lot of runners will jump to imaging when the reality is like go the conservative route. And then if you don't respond after months and months, maybe you even get a second opinion, mm-hmm. then get imaging. I always think of imaging as like 
another set of eyes, but then you also have to think like, why do you want imaging? Do you want imaging because you want surgery? Like, okay, then that's a good reason to get imaging. But mm -hmm. if you just want imaging because, you know, you just want to see what's going on, then that's a lot of money just to see what's going on. <laughs> yeah, totally. I could not... I could not agree more. I feel like this is just, this is a huge battle with a lot of my clients, but I feel like the ones that do the best that either get imaging or don't get imaging is they have like this team of like, you know, myself or a physical therapist. And then like the doctor that would do the imaging, they have this team of these people working together where they're like, um, you know, Hey, I can refer to them if it gets to that point. So there's always that option. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're not like, you know, totally shut off or like, or going to it right away. Yeah, for sure. What are like the top two injuries that you see in the hips? Like, what would you say like the top two most common injuries you see in the hips with runners are? Um, I would say for like my page specifically, which I'm like super niche. So people like look at my page that have like really just been going in it. Um, but I would say labral tears, symptomatic labral tears and FAI are probably the two biggest reasons people come to me and, yeah. and I see. Yeah. That's so an FAI can turn into a labral tear. And, you know, I'm sure you've, that's not even what we're talking about today. Um, if you're listening, but I'm yes. going down this rabbit hole, yes. um, cause I find it interesting, but it's like, you know, I'm sure with most of your patients and clients, like you're not like, Oh, you have a labral tear, like go get surgery. Like that's yeah. the only route. I think a lot of research is pointing to the conservative route for a labral tear. I mean, it mm -hmm. definitely depends on the grade of your labral tear, but if you know FAI or like hip impingement can turn into a labral tear, I think it's important to, you know, go to rehab early on. Don't wait until, you know, the pain is so severe, you can barely walk or you can barely run. Yeah, for sure. And, and to segue into what we are talking about, I will say like most people come to me with FAI or labral tear. However, I don't feel like their main pain generators are from those things. Um, so maybe they'll have tendinopathies or they'll have subsequent tendinopathies and it's like, okay, is what's driving this? And then that's kind of my job to, to facilitate the rehab based around that. Yeah, for sure. So today we are talking about proximal hamstring tendinopathy, also known as sit bone pain. So can you talk about why a lot of runners will experience proximal hamstring tendinopathy and like kind of a general, you know, idea of what it is? Yeah, for sure. So proximal hamstring tendinopathy, if you think of your hamstrings around the back of your thigh on both sides, and they insert like all of them insert right into kind of like your sit bone, like really deep into the glute um, on both sides, obviously. And the hamstrings themselves are really a unique muscle group where they primarily work eccentrically. They do work con concentrically as well, but they work eccentrically where if you think of like holding on to something, maybe like a, I don't know, a plate or something and like slowly lowering it down with your arms, that would be like an eccentric motion of your biceps. So that's, that's what that is. Um, but they have to do a ton of load eccentrically. And then they also have to contract really fast concentrically. Um, so the opposite direction, like lifting that plate. And when we're running, this places a huge load on the hamstring. Like it's a really, really big force. Um, so if we are potentially not strong through that area. We are lacking mobility through other areas. Um, we don't have like a quote unquote good, like running form or mechanics. This can lead to, um, proximal hamstring tendinopathy. Yeah, for sure. I know I've seen this a lot and it kind of like comes in waves, but going off of what you mentioned before, like, do you see the hamstrings usually as a weaker muscle in runners or usually more dominant? I would say weaker in runners, um, specifically into um, extension of the hip, or as they're acting like as a as a secondary muscle group into extension of the hip. Yeah, my hamstrings are weak. I was hoping you would say weak, just so I felt you know like the average, but yes. <laughs> I can definitely say my hamstrings are weak. And it's like you know, it's my left over my right, but I think you know, I could look and be like, my hamstrings are strong. I do deadlifts all the time. Like, yeah, you know, single leg deadlifts, but yes, the hamstrings work eccentrically, but they also work concentrically. So I think it's understanding too, like we, we have to strengthen them in these two different motions and yeah. like, or I guess contractions, because 
they are working in these two different contractions when we're running. Totally, totally. Yeah. And it's like this rapid switch between concentric and eccentric that the hamstrings really have to like undergo. So we have to train that to be able to do do what we got to do out there. Yeah, for sure. So when someone has proximal hamstring tendinopathy, um, do they usually have just a weak hamstring or is it a little bit more of what's going on at like the knee or the hip? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say anytime we're seeing like breakdown or dysfunction or like where your pain is, basically, um, we have to look around that joint. So obviously with rehab, like we're going to assess and treat that area, but that area didn't just like all of a sudden develop this breakdown pattern. It's probably compensating for something above or below that joint or even in front of. So um, wildly enough, I would say a lot of my gals that have um, labral tears or hip dysplasia will often have some showings of like proximal hamstring tendon weakening or fraying. And I really think it's because they don't, they kind of lack some of that stability in like the front and side of the hip. So the posterior hip kind of where that sit bone is, um, is the area that's compensating and like doing more of the work. Same thing if we're seeing like maybe lack of ankle mobility or poor ankle control or like weakness into the low back, just looking above and below is absolutely key to just make sure that this thing is actually going to be rehabbed and like not come back because of different compensations. Yeah, for sure. Can you give like a simple definition of hip dysplasia for people that don't know what that is? Yeah. So basically it is the way, so your hip joint is a ball and socket joint and it's like the congruency of that joint is, um, there's like a gradient of like how severe it can be and how, how minimal it can be. Um, but the congruency of those are less than, I guess, average. And and most of the times it is where the ball of the hip joint is a little bit smaller than the socket and just doesn't doesn't really like fit or congrue in like the most appropriate way. Thank you. And are most people born that way or does it turn into hip dysplasia? Yeah, I would say, um, I actually don't know the full answer to that question. I, I feel like hip dysplasia is something that is like, really emerging in kind of the adult world. Like we learn about it a lot in babies and Mm -hmm. if they have it as babies, it's like very apparent. Um, But I would say that there might be some like small cases of hip dysplasia that um, we're missing as babies and are carrying through and, or it's something that we can, um, we can build over time in like adolescence if we're, if we're moving through crazy hip ranges into adulthood. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So going back to proximal hamstring tendinopathy, I know, you know, if you look on social media, it just says like, just strengthen your hamstrings in an eccentric fashion. I think for any tendinopathy, like eccentrics can be good, but what is like the missing piece? Because proximal hamstring tendinopathy can be complicated to treat. It's kind of like Achilles tendinopathy or even like plantar fasciitis where it can linger for like months to like yeah even years yeah so you know I I don't think you know from my experience just treating the eccentrics of the hamstrings is like the full answer so what are other impairments that you usually see yeah for sure so I would say like at the hamstring specifically so if we do have someone that's an amazing PT in there they've looked above and below and they're fixing those things um that will be, you know, from person to person, but really at the hamstring specifically, there is like a whole progression that we need to go through to restore someone, not only back to like daily life, but also to running. So typically like with clients that I work with, I'll, I'll make this snappy, but with clients that I'll work with, like I'll have them start with just moving that hamstring through pain-free ranges. We'll move into isometric. So we're just kind of like contracting around that hamstring. Then we'll move into like slow and controlled um, eccentrics and concentrics, maybe like coupled together. So we're putting like a really great charge through that, that muscle and tendon area. Um, I'll move into some, some like just, just eccentrics as well for that tendon health. Um, And then finally I'll end with plyometrics and also um, throughout this whole time, I'm going to be like testing and tolerating their testing and seeing what their running tolerance is to, to ensure that they are, um, on track with like their running progression as well. 
Nice. Yeah, I like that. I think plyometrics are so important for runners, especially like the return to run process and then just continuing plyometrics and your strength. Um, so we've talked about before how our one-on-one clients are usually these runners who have been to PT for months before, and then they come to us. So what do you see, what are some mistakes that you see runners making with proximal hamstring tendinopathy before they come to you? Yeah. So two people really come to mind here. One, I've been messaging with this gal for a long time. She has lots of questions about her proximal hamstring tendinopathy, which, you know, that's wonderful. I love inquisitive people. Um, and she was ready to go, ready to go. And then was like, I am actually just going to get a PRP injection and just hope that that works. Um, she was also doing PT, but I really just believe, actually, I know because she told me what she was doing. She was really underloading that area. So it was just like maybe things like double limb glute bridges and clamshells and, um, yeah, just things that weren't really specific enough to that area. And then also weren't the exercises that she was doing weren't meeting the demands that she needed to get back to her running goal. So underloading, um, and then maybe just trying other options without like really having enough rehab work done. Yeah. Is there a lot of research that says that PRP is good for, hold on, pause. Um, Nicole, you can cut this. That's my podcast editor, but your mic is like clicking. I don't know. Should I just take it off? Yeah, you can take it off. It's like super sensitive. I don't know. Like I can hear. Okay. That's a lot better. Yeah. That's a lot better. Yeah. We're good. Um, okay. Back. Um, what was I saying? You were saying, Uh, Oh, I know what I was saying. Do you see PRP as a good treatment for proximal hamstring tendinopathy? Yeah, so this is a great question, and I would say PRP has been shown to do wonderful work in tendons, tendinopathies. I mean, it's still evolving research. It's still a huge risk. It's still out of out of pocket for I'm pretty sure every person. Um, so it, it's a it's a big thing. But I would say, like, if I had a proximal hamstring tendinopathy and I personally was doing all of the work. I knew I had the best PT for it and I still just wasn't progressing maybe as quickly as I, as I wanted. The first thing I would do would be to like look at different pathways of like, maybe there's something else going on physically that I can, I could be treating. Maybe like, like for example, like maybe it's more of my low back that's causing this. I would go that route first. Um, but then like, if it wasn't working, I, I probably would get a PRP injection just because of the ways that I've seen it, um, kind of be like a really great buddy with, uh, physical therapy and like allowing for people to have just a little bit more progression. I wouldn't say it's like absolutely necessary, but I also, I would say it is a nice adjunct treatment when you're doing the work in PT. Yeah. And I think too, you know, this is not for the the runner who just developed proximal hamstring tendinopathy. Like this is for the runner who has tried a lot of rehab before and needs like a little extra boost um, with treatment. So I think, you know, that's important to note, but it could just be like the, you know, the health of the tendon, like just coming down to making that tendon just a little bit stronger and helping to treat it. So I think you know, that's important. And that's PRP with anything like any injury, it should not be your first line of def- of treatment, just like how, you know, in most cases for runner surgery should not be your first thing that you're thinking about with an overuse injury. So that's totally. important to note. I know we had talked about PRP before, but yeah, definitely not a bad option. I mean, research, I think is saying it could be helpful. But if you're like, you know, if you're like, I've tried literally everything, then, you know, that little bit of hope, <laughs> it definitely could help. Yeah, for sure. I actually have a physician that I work with um, in the Seattle area, and he is just a huge nerd also, and he knows that I love the hip, and he's really, really discretionary and, like, really relies on his, like, medical expertise when he does give PRP, so... Um, meaning like he will only give it to people that are, are in extensive rehab, have tried lots of things. So I really trust like his discretion and he will often message me or email me and say, 
hey, Sarah, this is the case that went on. This person had a labral tear or a proximal hamstring tendinopathy, and we did um, some sort of orthobiologics. PRP is, is included in that. And he'll be like, and then this is the resolution of symptoms. So like, he'll give me some of these like, cl- like really like anecdotal clinical evidence, which is, is really fun. Yeah, for sure. So I'm, I'm just thinking of a client that I had that had um, proximal hamstring tendinopathy, but it was interesting because it started with like chronic, chronic low back pain, like 10 mm. years of low back pain, and then went to like pelvic floor pain and then proximal hamstring tendinopathy. So do you see it as starting as something else or like kind of like a cause and effect, or do you usually just see it as proximal hamstring tendinopathy and that's it? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know if I've ever had someone. No, that's not true. I have. I have had someone come to me for just proximal hamstring tendinopathy and it was, it was acute and they came fast. Um, but I know that there was some low back and like ankle weakness. Um, so there were other factors, but I will say like a lot of the gals that I work with will have some like low back and or hip stuff going on. And then, and then as I'm kind of digging through their history, they'll be like, Oh yeah, when I was 24, I did have like pain in my sit bone and and a history of proximal hamstring tendinopathy. Um, so I would say it goes both ways. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about the runner who is having pain sitting. Like maybe they also have pain running, but you know they're sitting for most of the day at work. What advice do you have for them? Because I know, like for me, I hear that you know a lot of people just think about like runners in general, if you're having an injury, like the first thing you do is stretch it. Yes. And with this, I will say you do not want to stretch it. Do not, do stretch. not stretch the hamstring. I know it's tempting, but don't do it. Um, so what would you say like to the person who is having like excruciating sit bone pain um, yes. or proximal hamstring tendinopathy, a lot of pain in sitting? Yeah, totally. This sucks. This sucks so bad. I feel like this is the part of having an injury that is just like, like, I remember when I was in the thick of my hip injury, like driving and then going to work. Like I was like this, like I, this just hurts. And like, I can't like really, like, it's not even like I can't run. Like I just can't do my day to day. So I'm sorry, this sucks. Um, but some suggestions that I have are your best position is your next position. So you can get up and like, set a timer on your phone and get up every 30 minutes. That's awesome. Um, There's like some really cool, not cool, but there's wedges that you can sit on or like roll up a sweatshirt. So you're kind of not in as much of like a slump and like as much pressure through there. Um, If you work from home, like changing positions from sit to stand or even like tall kneeling um, is awesome. And then my final one is um, this is a trick I learned in PT school, but like taking two tennis balls or even just one and just sitting on that and like doing a little bit of, of release through there. I wouldn't like sit on it forever, but like maybe 10 minutes at a time. I think just having these like changes in position is going to decrease the like compression and irritation on that tendon level and, and give you like more relief than you would have if you were just sitting all day, but probably not like complete resolution in that acute phase. Yeah, for sure. Because I mean, if you're having a lot of pain and sitting, it just comes down to there being a lot of inflammation in the tendon. And I like that about the tennis ball, though. That's so interesting. I always do like the mobilization with movement, I guess you could say with like a lacrosse ball and sitting and you just like are sitting on the lacrosse ball where, you know, your proximal hamstring attaches and then you're straightening and then bending your knee. But that's a good one. I mean, yeah, definitely don't cause more inflammation yeah and know the difference between like okay it's getting worse or it you know hurts so good but yeah that's a really good tip I like that a lot yeah I'll use that a lot for my clients that have to sit on planes for a long period of time just Hmm. them like different change into the system you know they're not sitting on the 10 hour plane ride but (laughs) 10 minutes on 20 minutes off yeah for sure when you're treating a runner with PHT, do you see like different characteristics in their running form? Or like, I'm just thinking of now, like we talked about the acute runner, and then you're going through rehab, you're going through these stages. Now we're back into running, you know, you did your plyometrics, we're back to running. But say you have pain starting at like mile three or four. Are you seeing like a difference in their running form? Like, 
at mile three or four or like are you notice anything different going on yeah for sure so I mean I feel like our our natural instinct is like if we're painful on that side we are going to try to get off of that side more so maybe it's something that's really 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 um sly like it's not like totally con- or perceivable to them but let's say it's my right side like I'm gonna have a little bit less time in stance on my right um that's kind of the first thing that I'd see I'd also see like a little bit less like follow through or like extension of that leg so when that leg is like becoming the trailing limb they don't really want to go into that like um into that motion because it's going to put more more stress through the the hamstring um and then I wouldn't necessarily say that like the kind of picking up the leg and going into the next swing would be something that I see, but that is a motion that's going to stress the hamstring, but I can't say that I'd specifically see that in, in my runners. Yeah. I see a lot of overstriders. And then, um, like you said, like if they have like a cool watch that says how much time they spend in stance, then it will say like 40% in the left, 60% on the right or something like that, where it's like, actually milliseconds and we would not really know or you know maybe we're taking like short choppy steps so we aren't overstriding um I think that one is really key because a lot of people say like to increase their cadence if you're overstriding but there's definitely a lot more that goes into it but if you think about like someone who's overstriding they are lengthening their hamstring as much as they really can in a stride and that's just you know, in that eccentric contraction. And if our, if our muscle and our tendon is not strong enough, you know, that's where things can definitely, you can increase that load through that weak area. So I think working on running form is something that I definitely recommend. (laughs) Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Could, could not agree more. Yeah. Do you see, um, do you see like a, um difference in like the timing of when the hamstring turns on and like do you also see and obviously we don't have like gate labs we work from home but (laughs) do you see like a difference in like a dominant hip flexor and like a weak hamstring or like a dominant hip flexor weak glute weak weak hamstring because that's something I've been seeing a lot I'm kind of just curious if you see that yeah for sure so One test that I'm thinking of that I really enjoy doing on pretty much all of my clients is, and I guess I'll do it both ways, but um, they're laying on their stomach, so prone, and I'll have them just extend one leg, so lift one leg up off the table, and then lift the other leg off the table, and we'll just kind of like see what happens um, in, in the patterning. And in the perfect world, we'll have like beautiful low back engagement, beautiful glute engagement, and then that hamstring will turn on as well. But oftentimes what I'll see in the dysfunctional leg, so the hamstring tendinopathy um, or even the hip as well, I'll see this like crossed pattern. So it's like um, their, if it's their right hamstring, like I'll see their left low back, like really struggling to turn on. And then I'll see weakness through like that the right glute and then the right hamstring. Um, And then on that right side, I'll probably see some quad dominance. So it is like this kind of cross pattern that is leading to um, weakness through like the posterior chain on the, on the cross pattern and then we are dominance of the quad and hip flexor um, on the painful hamstring side. If that makes sense. If you're listening to this and you're like, how is that a thing? Then it's important to note that with the lumbar stabilizers, the multifidus does contralateral stabilization. So Mm -hmm. left multifidus, which is a deep lumbar spine stabilizer, um, stabilizes so the right leg can move. So that's that cross pattern that she's talking about. Um, Mm -hmm. And same thing, vice versa. So I think you know, kind of like what you said, I see a lot of like lumbar spine, like the stabilizers are all of a sudden like the movers of the leg. And that should definitely not be the case. They should just be stabilizing. So a lot of that excessive movement of the lumbar spine, when you, you know, you could think it's coming from the hip, but when someone actually like looks at what's going on, then it's like, okay, there's a lot of movement at the lumbar spine and the hip is super tight and like glute max and hamstring aren't necessarily like turning on as much as they should. Like the first thing that is moving is the lumbar spine. So that's a good test. I definitely like that. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoy that one a lot. And it's like, I think, you know, 
that's kind of like a technical test. I feel like if you're listening to it and you're like, what the heck? But truly, like when I put my clients on their stomach and then they they go into that position and they're doing their right and their left. I mean, I will just ask them what side feels harder for you and what feels harder for you. And they'll be like, yeah, this right side's way harder. Like I can't mm-hmm. like keep my stomach on the table. And like they they know, like these people are very smart. They're very in tune with their bodies, even if it's mm-hmm. even if it's these minute differences. Um, so it's, it's kind of a fun thing to just test on yourself as well. Yeah. And I like to do, um, I like to do the same thing and then put your hands on the front of your pelvis and then feel if like one side is popping up, like that's Mm -hmm. a pretty good indication that your hip is not going into that hip extension. And it's just, you're trying to compensate, but you're moving a lot with the lumbar spine. Um, that's like probably the number one movement pattern that I see with hip pain. I feel like yeah. if yeah. I had to pick one. <laughs> totally. Totally. And I love that test. Cause I feel like it is so specific to running because running is not just like my leg moves and then I rotate my trunk. Like it's all happening at once. So it's like, how are you coordinating all of this motion at one time without thinking about it? Cause when we're running, we're not like, all right, left glute, turn on right. Multifidi. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that, you know, if you're the runner who's like, I don't feel like my glute turning on when you're running, that's okay. You probably don't feel your quad turning on either. You know, you probably don't feel your calf turning on unless it's a hard run. So it's like, you don't have to squeeze your glute to contract it. You don't have to squeeze your hamstring to contract it. Running should be super natural. It should be like a relaxing activity. It shouldn't be like, okay, breathe you know, left glute, right glute, left quad, you know, like that is too much. And your brain is smart. It knows how to like turn everything on at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I, that's a huge thing that I try to do with my clients. They're like, well, what, what should I be doing? And I'm like, just go run, like, just go run and enjoy. (laughs) And, and, you know, when you need cues, I'll give you easy cues and it it Mm -hmm. should be really that easy. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Is there anything else? We've talked about a lot about proximal hamstring tendinopathy, but is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you want to touch on with it? Yeah, yeah. I feel like you really, you did this in my episode on my podcast as well. And I feel like I just can't say it enough, but I'll give it just an anecdotal story. So um, my run coach is amazing. He's an ultra runner. Um, he's like, he just is a phenomenal runner and athlete. And he was dealing with proximal hamstring tendinopathy. Um, and this is kind of during the time when he was like on the, on the cusp of emerging into his running career, um, where he maybe wasn't like sponsored by things, but, um, was like doing well in ultra running and like wanted to kind of pursue this. And he, um, was in Phoenix, which is where I went to grad school and, uh, started going to a PT for this proximal hamstring tendinopathy And like, he's smart. He just quickly realized he was like, I kind of just feel like I'm sitting here doing these exercises and like, no one's really like telling me what to do. Like, you know, I don't really feel like I'm progressing towards my goals and like kind of looking around and being like, "Ah, like these people are great and amazing, but I don't think anyone in here like runs as much as I do and like kind of understands the demands of that. And he was frustrated and immediately, well, not immediately, but after some time, actually started doing some research and started and found a PT who specializes in proximal hamstring tendinopathy and actually worked with him virtually. I believe he's in Australia. Um, I had him on the podcast. Yes. Yeah. Go back (laughs) to that episode. Um, But yeah, he was like, he was like, Sarah, like the difference of my care was unbelievable. He was like the amount of time that I, he was like, first of all, I didn't have to go to PT anymore. Like I just had these appointments. I knew my exercises um, and he was like the, the strides and like the changes that he made in that time was phenomenal. Um, and, and also this, this PT was really able to say, okay, you're going to run on flat ground first. Um, and then you're going to like, once you kind of progress to this, then you're going to progress to, to hills and speed work, which is more stressful on the proximal hamstring tendon. Um, so I think if you're going through this and you're like, this has been like a chronic thing um, and I'm not getting better. Like I would say reach out to someone who has had success um, in, in proximal hamstring tendinopathies and getting people back to the goals that you specifically have as well. Yeah, for sure. And for those wondering, it's Dr. Um, Brody Sharp that yeah. she's talking about, but 
in terms of like I know I said this on yours but like just because a PT is a runner doesn't mean that they specialize in treating runners I think that is so important to note I think uh, you know having the experience of treating runners and like testimonials from treating runners that's something that you should be asking for because it's your time it's your money and you want to get back to running and the more chronic that an injury is it doesn't matter if it's proximal hamstring tendinopathy or anything else the more chronic an injury is the more complex it gets I think that's just like the reality of it because you know like we've been talking about it's not oh, it's just proximal hamstring tendinopathy. We're just doing, you know, eccentrics. And if your PT has you just doing like bridges and clamshells and like very, and says, oh, this is because your core is weak. I feel like I've been hearing that all the time for yeah. every injury yes. and it might be weak, but is that why it's coming on? And with proximal hamstring tendinopathy, it can be complicated. You can have like a, it could be from your low back. It could be from even like pelvic floor, like you know, hip dysplasia or something else like that, where it's like, you need more than just like your traditional PT exercises. And there's nothing wrong with like trying to see a traditional PT first. But if you are not seeing progress, if they're not listening to you, even if you're with them for 10 minutes, like that's a red flag, you know, that is such a red flag. And I think a lot of runners like are like, oh, you know, I need to use my insurance. I pay for insurance. I got to use it. But you know, time is, time is so valuable. And like, you don't need to be doing table exercises. If you're running, you know, like you need to have someone who understands like this entire journey and getting back to running and being able to give you tips on the progression of running. Like it shouldn't be, Oh, you're back to running. Like you're discharged. I feel like I'm just talking about like, a million red flags right now that I've seen. Yes. <laughs> but it's like, I'm just ranting now, but I think it's so important. Like, I think that's just one of my pet peeves is like, oh, you're back yeah. to running, like you're discharged. But it's like, well, what happens now? Like, because a lot of runners will progress and be like, you know, start out running 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and then they'll get injured again. Totally, totally. And I think, um, I think one of my favorite things of going down this whole running rabbit hole of being a PT that works with runners and being a coach virtually that works with runners. Like there's just so many things that you could do. There's so many variables that we can kind of change to make this perfect recipe for your running week to be a success. Like even if you do have a proximal hamstring tendinopathy, I would say a lot of my clients, probably all of them, definitely all of them throughout the course of their rehab are running as as a part of their rehab and like Mm -hmm. we can still assign like terrain and speed and different types of running workouts to like get that stimulus of running in maybe it's not going to look 100 percent like you want to but I think this whole thing of like just stop running or like cut down your mileage or whatever I think it's negligent like it's not like it's almost unethical like it's not Mm -hmm. it's not what you came there to do and like there's so much that you can do so working with someone who understands the intricacies of run run programming um Mm -hmm. pt is just it's awesome it's worth it yeah definitely and like even if you're going to a pt and you're like my goal is just to get back to running without pain you know that should not mean that your discharge is right when you start running that should be like taking okay understanding like you obviously want to get back to running without pain but taking it one step further once you are doing those return to run intervals or once you are progressing your running like well what is your goal now until I can confidently say like you are on track to progress your running on your own or with a run coach and that pain is most likely not going to come back because and you know the tools and like exercises that you need to do if it does come back it's not just like after eight weeks fingers crossed you're back to running and we're done you know I think with all of my runners I have to get them back into run intervals or like you know running whatever their goals are what how many however many days a week before I feel super confident because you know, we are trained to do this. We are trained to progress our clients in a certain way. And there's a certain science behind it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I just think like that is so, so important to not leave a runner on their own with that. I've seen it like flop so many times. Yes. Yeah. A runner left to their own 
devices is <laughs> <that's> <laughs> not great. Even like my clients that I work with, I have one runner who every week she comes in and I'm like, okay, like this is the plan this week. Like we're really going to stick to it. And this is why we're going to stick to it. And I have her tell it back to me because I know that if she doesn't understand that she's going to add another 30 minute run on. And I'm like, we can't, we don't have time for this. Yeah. We don't know. Like that's not necessarily what your body needs yes. and it might be hurting it more than it's helping it. So yeah, for sure. I mean, we went down that rabbit hole, but it was a good little Ted talk. <laughs> yes, totally. That is my Ted talk. That is, that's where I stand. <laughs> yeah, for real. Like people asked what, um, like annoys me and it's not like anything normal. It's like, stuff about PT runners. Yes. Totally. Doing a bazillion clamshells. Oh, oh go my on. gosh. Don't get Please me started. Don't. Yeah. Um, well, this has been fun, Sarah. Where can my listeners find you? Yeah. The place that I'm the most active is Instagram. Um, I always message really every person that follows me. I think it's like, it's like coming to my house. I'm like, hello, how are you doing? Um, so you can message me there. My link tree has lots of goodies. Um, and then if you want to book a call with me, it's strategywithsarah.com to just check out what's been going on with the hip or proximal hamstring. Awesome. Yeah, I will link everything below. But thank you again. I really appreciate it. Yes. Thanks so much for having me.